Um, so this is the bounce back lecture series, but we're not going to be doing a bounce back case today. We're going to be talking about critical care documentation. Um, thank you, team. So we're going to define critical care. Uh, we're going to go over a case involving some critical care stuff. Summary. Uh, so the CPT, the current procedural terminology, it's a medical code that's set and maintained by the American Medical Association. It defi defines medical procedures, uh, diagnostic services, surgical services, and it's basically designed to be a uniform communication, uh, to communicate uniform information about medical services provided to patients. So according to CPT, there are three main tenets of critical care to define critical care. First off, there has to be a critical illness or injury, um, which involves one or more vital organ systems that are impaired with high probability of imminent or life-threatening deterioration of a patient's condition. And they've given some examples of organ, sy organ systems, um, but we know that it can be any single or combination of organ systems. The second tenet is there has to be a critical intervention, uh, which involves high complexity decision making to support this organ failure and prevent further deterioration. So the literature states that typically this occurs in an ED, ICU, or surgical, post-surgical setting, but it also states that technically it can occur anywhere. Um, and for those of us who've been at UHB where they've had like code 66 or code 99 in an endoscopy suite, on the first floor, if you're there and you perform critical care there, you can, you can count that towards critical care time. And the third tenet is critical care time. Um, so that's time spent engaged in the work directly related to your patient's care. Um, so if there's a few things that it requires. It requires the full attention of the attending physician. It re requires an ongoing and active role in managing the patient's care, although it doesn't have to be continuous. And there's going to be some things in these slides that I'll have to go back to and talk a little bit more about. And this is one of them. Um, and the physician has to be immediately available as necessary at any time. Um, so there's something called the critical care approval clock. And it stops during separately reportable procedures. And we will, I'll go over that in a little bit. So Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has improved upon or expanded upon the definition. So they require all the three aspects of the CPT definition of critical care in order to bill for critical care, but they've specified a couple of things. First of all, fa failure to initiate the therapy would likely result in sudden, sudden clinically significant life-threatening deterioration of a patient's condition. And then in addition, it not only requires the recognition of a critical illness or injury, but it also requires the inclusion of high-level treatments and interventions that are medically necessary and reasonable. So what I take this to mean is that it's not so much a separate definition, but more improvement on your documentation because I really doubt that any of us are going to recognize a critical illness or injury and then recognize the intervention that needs to be done and then just write it down and not actually perform it. So I think that this is really a billing and reimbursement issue. And so the CMS definition, which is like a separate, um, a separate paper, I think it's basically just encouraging really clear and thorough documentation or you won't get reimbursed for it. <coughs> so there is a limit. You have to be performing critical care for at least 30 minutes. Uh, under 30 minutes is not, you cannot bill for critical care. Um, and that's significant because reimbursement for critical care is significantly higher. It can be up to 25% higher than even just comprehensive medical care. Um, and so think about the patients that we see in CCT, even in downstate, our APE patients. From the time they come in to the time they get disposed or stabilized, typically all those things would be at least 30 minutes. They're complex patients. We're reassessing them. We're providing treatment, airway support. And so every single one of those types of patients, severe asthma exacerbations, could probably uh, add up to about 30 minutes of care and could be billed for critical care time. So CBT specifies that at teaching hospitals, having resident documentation of critical care does not equal reimbursement and will not be counted towards critical care. 
And so the attending physician has to attest that critical care was performed and document as such. Um, if the resident and the attending physician work, are working together, that's okay too. Um, but it has to be documented by the attending physician. And CMS gives an example that I think highlights how easy it is to do so. Uh, the example is two sentences, and it basically just says, patient deteriorated, I provided treatment to the patient, this is how long I provided treatment to the patient, as long as it's more than 30 minutes. And then it even takes a nod back to the resident documentation. I read that, I agree with it, that's the plan. CPT goes over supporting documentation and lists four basic things to improve your documentation. First of all, you want to describe all interval reassessments of patients. You should be doing that anyway. Uh, discuss the impairments of the organ systems based on relevant and available data. And that it, it's a kind of a vague terminology, but it's basically like the vital signs, the labs, their past medical history. It's kind of everything. Um, document your rationale and the timing of your interventions, and then document the response to treatments. So um, there's a lot of different places that say different things, but one common thread is that it's really encouraged for attending physicians to state plainly that they deliver critical care for at least 30 minutes, but more, th more than 30 if you did. Um, it just ensures that you're more likely to be reimbursed for critical care. And then the our, our main charts where we have to do like four points in the HBI and eight of the systems doesn't apply to critical care documentation. So the critical care bundle in your 30 to 74 minutes in your 99291 code, 99292 code, these are the things that are included um, and they are not separately billable items. So you can include basically chart reviewing, you can include reviewing uh, previous labs for a patient, uh, current labs for a patient, you can include man managing a ventilator, and then peripheral, peripheral vascular access procedures, so peripheral IVs. And then the critical care accrual clock will stop during separately billable procedures, and you have to document these separately. Um, and I, I feel like there's some things on here that are a little bit confusing, so if anybody has um, any thoughts about this, CPR is, is a separately billable procedure. So if you have a patient that comes in and at the door loses pulses, and you perform CPR for 65 minutes, within that time you intubate a patient, you put in a central venous catheter, those are separately billable procedures. But my understanding is that if the majority of the care that you're providing to a patient is CPR, you can't actually bill for critical care time. And then there was a, one of the literature stated that attending physicians do not have to be actively participating in CPR, they can be uh, overseeing CPR, and they still can't bill it as critical care time. So I don't know if anybody has questions about that, but I found that a little bit confusing because that means that if the critical care that you're giving to a patient doesn't equal 30 minutes outside of that, you can't bill for critical care time. But it's usually going to, right? There's always post-intubation resuscitation, so... You mean if, the, if you're still, if you're still yeah, doing CPR? Exactly. Like even after CPR, you have to maintain it, the person, right? If they gain ROS? If they were that. But well, I'm saying if you if they come in and at 65 minutes you and pronounce them deceased. dead. They're deceased. Yeah. Like, you're not probably going to get much out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so ASAP recommends that in your documentation you actually state that the time involved in the performance of separately billable procedures was not included in critical care time. Um, and it's just another way that people can dock reimbursement. So you want to see very plainly. Um, and Dr. Ron, you wanted me to try to find a source to say whether or not you have to document separately billable procedures in your note versus just write a procedure note, and I, I couldn't really find any information on that. So diagnostic pearl for critical care. Have a distinct diagnosis for each procedure that you document. So for a multiple trauma patient, Right, you're performing critical care because of closed head injury, intubation, because of respiratory failure, and so on. Okay, does anyone have any questions about definition of critical care or documentation of critical care before we move on to the case? Okay, I'm just going to kind of run through the case, and what I want you guys to do is not uh, I basically want you to just think about, if you had this patient, how might you document critical care adequately for a patient? So this is a triage note. 
Um, chief complaint is abdominal pain with nausea, bloody vomiting for three days, non-radiating chest pain. Vitals are fairly stable, maybe, maybe some relative hypertension. The HPI says 68-year-old male, history of hypertension, not taking medications, drinks about a liter of hard alcohol per day, uh, abdominal pain with bloody vomit times three days, dark stool, no chest pain. Uh, the PE may be relative hypotension again, patient's jaundice, conjunctival pallor, uh, lungs and heart are normal, diffuse mild tenderness to palpation without guarding or rebound the belly, rectal exams normal, no blood, otherwise fine. And then the AMP basically adds on that the EKG is normal sinus rhythm with prolonged QT, um, concern for upper GI bleeding varices, admit for endoscopy. So this is our first critical lab value. Hemoglobin was 3.6. Platelet's normal. This is our second critical lab value, troponin of 4.5. Uh, CMP has some mild arrangements, generally. Nothing to about. And then this is our first update now. Patient endorsed to CCT senior found to have hemoglobin of 3, troponin of 4, GI cardiology, make you consulted, 2 IVs placed, protonic supporter. And then our dispo note, severe anemia, troponinemia, admitted to the MICU. So on our timeline, you can see a patient was in the ED for about five and a half hours. The patient was upgraded towards the end of their care about 12 minutes later with dispo. Um, but between 7 and 8.30, red blood cells were ordered, red blood cells were transfused. Um, there was a console with a critical care upgraded, uh, upgraded critical care. Um, okay. So just generally before we get into critical care documentation, general thoughts about the documentation for the case. Anybody want to comment on that? Do, they, do you think it was adequate? Hemoglobin of 3.6. What do you think? Um, and interestingly, we're below the national average. 
So the national average for billing for critical care charts is about 3 to 4 percent. At UHB, it's 2 percent. But we know the patients that we see at UHB. They are sick. There are a lot of sick patients at UHB that could easily be billed for critical care time. Um, and so if you're working at a place in the future where your money is tied into RVUs, you can increase your salary by thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year. This is an example Dr. Ford sent to me. So if you increase your critical care charting by 2% per year from 1.5% to 3.5% and you work in an ED with 45,000 patients, that means you're increasing your charting by 900 patients a year. And so since going from, the 99285 is basically like a comprehensive ED visit where a patient gets admitted and it's not that complicated and there's no critical care involved. If you can increase your chart from that to a 99291 critical care chart, you're increasing the chart value by $50. So times 900 patients a year is $45,000. For you a year, yes. Oh, do you know if I had genetic complications, like low dose growth care, like if, if a power injector infiltrates, or if you draw some Islam doing the central line and you have to deal with the complications, are you allowed to go for that stuff? I don't know. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's I'm not encouraging you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it meant we have to say what you mean, right? I didn't mean that.
why the attendings um, kind of fail at it. And just one last thing. Yes, you're going to make more money in a, in a, in a sort of beat and kill shop, but in emergency medicine, what's good for your department is good for the hospital, all right? Because 90% of the ERs, you're sort of a hospital employee, whether you're a CMG or you're you know, even an independent contractor or you're a hospital-based person. But the better your department does as a, as a group, because we build the critical care, but remember, most of the hospital reimbursement, there's two types of reimbursement. There's what the doctor gets and what the hospital gets. And the hospital reimbursement is usually two to three times what the doctor gets. So you take that number and you triple it, that's a good bottom line for the actual hospital. And when your boss, this guy, is the head of the hospital, um, it makes him look good and our department look good. So it, it does matter. Um, if you're in a small mom and pop shop out in, in, in the burbs um, and you can do this kind of thing, your hospital bottom line goes up. And that's good for your department because in those mom and pop shops, it's a tough business. There are groups that lose their contracts because one of the big groups come in and say, we can decrease your bottom line if you get rid of these, these clowns and bring in <coughs> such and such, you know, happy, um, emergency department. Um, and that matters. So the more you can do to increase your, your critical care and your documentation in general, it's actually a good thing for you, for your reimbursement, for the patient and actually for the hospital. Summary. 30 to 74 minutes. <laughs> Could you go through and compare your time? Uh, remember to uh, document your separately billable items and to state that you did not include them in your critical care time. And then key points to improve our documentation, which are in part of the critical care literature, but I think in general, we should be doing this for all of our patients. Um, and I, I think it would be good legally and financially and really better for the patients overall. Questions? So you can bill for more than 74 minutes. So you can. So it's 30 to 74 minutes is the 99291. Every additional 30 minutes is a 99292. So you can have as many of those as the time it takes for you to care for a person. Um, you can only bill for 99291 once in a visit. Um, but yeah, if you do like three hours of critical care, then you can have 99291 plus 99292 times however many. Josh, I have a quick question about should you guys, should the residents be documenting in T system or in I think the county? Um, that's fine. I think it's a good practice to get into. But make sure you let the attending know, hey, I, I documented this. The attending cannot reference that. <laughs> they can't just say, hey, see residents know. The attending has to write in their own note, I provide it and I supervise. So I think it's a good practice for the residents to go in and document it, um, but it doesn't mean anything unless the attending. So it's up to you to let the attending know I put some group care stuff in there. You can cut and paste mine, don't do that. Um, but you can just please write group care on your note because I got it. There is a click and document too for the attending. Once you do the disposition, there's a click for critical care. So it's also a click and you can retext it um, with that click. If I write 30 minutes and the resident writes down 45 or 60 and then document it more things, it, there's no difference. There's no difference between 31 minutes and 73 minutes. It's 30 to 73. It's 30 to 74, and then above 75. Um, so 991 is just 30 minutes. So your code that comes in, and you get it upstairs in 29 minutes. By by definition, that was not critical care. Okay? It has to be 30 minutes where you're doing stuff. And again, as you said, I'll just reiterate it. Thinking about patients. Calling family members, calling their TCP, calling consults of cardiology, reading EKGs, thinking about what we should do. Should we beta block the patient? Did he get mad? Did he get clavix? Did he freeload the pepper? Whatever. That's all mental. It's not just doing stuff at the bedside or showing the chest. It's thinking about this patient. It's pretty much a good barometer is any single person that goes to either the guy see you or step down, by definition, should be um, critical care. And there are many others like that. Like that um, CHF with its tripod, and they come in, you buy that one every single bit, and they just they look great in three hours. 
that's we, we see like eight of those a day, um, and almost all of them I can tell when we used to review them. Most of those do not get documentary scores. There. They should, and they, it's totally legit. You're not gaming the system because again, these coders aren't ER docs. They don't know sick people. They just sit in the basement and code things and turn it words into, words into numbers. Um, they don't understand a lot of these things. So you need to be as, as expressly or express yourself very clearly. John, if a patient has a language say it could be under 30 minutes, but you've got to know the patient beforehand and you've got to understand the way you're performing, that's still legit. Yeah, that's close. I mean, you know, it, yes, it, it could be. You know, you got the phone call from EMS, you activated code H in the path that I just spoke to the fellow on the phone, they're in the ER for 20 minutes. You know, if somebody's going to go back and review it, they say, well, the person you got the phone call at, you know, at 9.13 and they were out of the ER at 9.25, that's a little, that's kind of BS. Yes, you know, the question of documenting after the patient is in this position is fine because you're kind of actively doing it, you know, but if they're, again, think about the 30 minute. We don't do a lot of 9992 because most places don't, because in most places in the country, if somebody's so sick and need to go to the ICU, they don't stay two days in the ER, right? That's not like normal in most places. It's mm -hmm. we're kind of get used to it. Um, so, you know, it's your care. And it's also, depending on where you work, it's the person who last touches the patient is the one getting credited with the, the, the their documentation. So, you know, I'm not saying to, to stretch it, um, but I think if we, if we did it with all these asthmatic kids and the tripodic safe peppers and the real steel PDRs and you know even you know the end semi that just has all this stuff going on and they've got some real insufficiency and they, the troponins 1.4 you know and they're like yeah, what are we going to do with them the medicine doesn't want them they're like cardiology consult they stay for nine hours in the ER until somebody decides to take them that's legit people go into the OR I mean you know a bleeding threatened AB that's a little hypotensive your, your cousin can't help them, but you can. The other thing is that patients that come in, we'll just keep going with an asthmatic example, but they're in, they have, they're having a bad asthma attack, but they turn around and go out, and you end up discharging them, you can still build for critical care time with patients that you discharge. They don't have to be admitted in order for them to be critical care or reverse. So then is it to our advantage, since you know, like all these patients that were like, oh, you can see CT, got a gap of 26, let's like close the gap, I mean, I'm going to say that you should do what's best for your patient, but if you are closing the gap in CCT and it takes an hour and a half, that's an hour and a half of critical care time. I mean, you're, you're basically described, it's a note like a normal note, right? Um, but there's something about this patient that makes them critical, which is that if you did not give them this intervention, that they would have clinically deteriorated and possibly died. So do we think this is a critical care patient? Yeah, so some of the literature that I looked at said that it's really important to state that you deliver critical care for a certain number of minutes. Um, and you can say I delivered critical care for 47 minutes, um, patient became hypoxic and I, we gave them BiPAP, um, patient became hypotensive, the patient legal bed was initiated. I mean, those are critical interventions. Um, those are, that's pharmacologic therapy, that's, that's critical care. Jenna, Jenna, it's what you're doing, that's what you're documenting. Not, you know, so much what the patient was doing, but what Thank you.